she's looking at Good morning, RPC family and friends. Good to see you today. Very pleased that you could make it uh, on this Lord's Day to worship our God, our Savior. And uh, just take a note in your, in your bulletin, you'll see one of these little invitations. Now, these are not for you. These are for you to give to family and friends to come on, uh, on Christmas Eve. Did you know that Christmas Eve is the service when people are most likely to come? Uh, so uh, be, please be praying about those whom you might invite, and we've got plenty of these if you'd like some more to, um, to give to your friends and family members. We also have some readings for Advent, if you would like to pick those up on the table out there. And as if you didn't already know, it is, it is Advent when we talk about the word which means coming. Advent means coming. And with the lighting of each candle, we remember that Jesus is the light of the world. And as each scripture is read, we turn our hearts to reflect on a particular element of our Savior's coming. This morning, the Bethlehem candle reminds us that the place of Jesus' birth was predicted in scripture. And there's another coming that we're looking forward to, is there not? And uh, his second coming is as sure as the first. And next time he comes, we'll meet him in the air. We're so grateful to Andrew and Laura Johnson who are going to come and light the, uh, the Bethlehem candle for us today. Good morning. Um, on the second Sunday of Advent, we're lighting the Bethlehem candle. And the Bethlehem candle reminds us that the Son of God was born as a human baby in a specific place at a specific time in history. The prophet Micah said, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of Israel. Let us approach God together using these words from Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And his name shall be called of the increase of his government and of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. From this time forth and forevermore. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you and you alone in all and reverence to lift up and magnify and praise your holy name. You are the creator and sustainer of all, the Alpha and the Omega, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. All praise, honor, and glory is due your name. Help us to genuinely worship you from our hearts in word, deed, and thought. May your spirit guide us and speak to our hearts as we come into your presence. Holy, holy, holy are you, God Almighty. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
please remain standing. Let us corporately uh, confess our faith from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What offices does Christ fill as our Redeemer? How does Christ fill the office of prophet? How does Christ fill the office of priest? How does Christ fill the office of a king? Please remain standing as we worship him in song.
Children ages four through first grade are now dismissed to children's worship. And please remain standing and greet one another in Again, we want to extend a, a special greeting to you if you're visiting with us for the first time. We're so glad that, uh, that you're here with us today. And uh, if this is your first time, please stop at the Welcome Center on the way out. We have a gift for you on the way out, a small token of our appreciation for your coming. And uh, also, see the men are bringing the, uh, the ushers rather, are bringing the uh, visitors, or actually the registration books, so please sign those. We're always glad to know that you're here. For our time of prayer today, we want to uh, include our missionaries for the month, uh, Stephen and Susan Beck. And by the way, if you haven't marked your calendars, March, excuse me, May 17th to 19th, we'll be celebrating the 40th anniversary of RPC. And Stephen Beck was the founding pastor of the church. How many of you were here at the founding? See, look at that. That's great. But we know that you must be very young, um, and that you must have been very young when the church was founded. <laughs> but I, I bring that up because Stephen Beck was the founding pastor, and now he continues to be supported by our church in their ongoing ministry. So uh, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Almighty God, as we come to you today, we come to acknowledge your lordship and despite all that we see in the world despite the, t the turmoil in our lives we can say that all is well with our souls because you have redeemed us you have brought us into your kingdom you have brought us into your family we're so grateful for the joy that you give us as we walk with you, as we grow in our knowledge of you. We thank you, Father, for those who are our partners in missions around the world. We thank you for the Becks. First of all, we thank you for the ministry that they had here at the very beginning of this congregation. And now we pray that you would continue to be with them as they train church planters around the world. And uh, we pray that you would provide all the resources necessary for that work. We ask that you would also be with him as he works a part-time on a staff in uh, Minnesota. All these things, Lord, we pray that they would have the resources that they need to accomplish, accomplish their work for your glory. And Father, we pray for those who are recovering from illnesses and and surgeries. We pray for your strength for them. We want to pray for Jan Long today, who is scheduled for surgery this week. We pray that you would give the doctors great wisdom as they, as they care for her, and that her 
that her recovery would be complete and uncomplicated. Father, we thank you as well for the many ministries of this church. We thank you for all who are involved in uh, teaching in as many ways, uh, children and youth and uh, young adults. We thank you as well for uh, the youth ministry's activity tonight here at RPC. We know that others will be coming from other churches and we pray that this would be a great time of, of fellowship and encouragement uh, for all who come. And as we think about uh, this time of year, Lord, we know it's, it's a, a time of, of celebration and you've enabled us through your grace to know why this is so important. And we pray that you would help us to prayerfully consider uh, the needs of others around us, both their physical needs and their spiritual needs, Lord. We pray that you would lay on our hearts the names of those whom you would have us to invite to join us here at RPC during this season, especially on Christmas Eve. We pray that for all of these ministries and outreaches that you would please uh, bless them, cause them to be fruitful uh, for your name's sake and for your glory. We thank you for the generosity of this congregation to support this ministry and its partners here and around the world. And we pray that you would uh, receive this offering as from thankful hearts May you be glorified in them. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll now receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Uh, ministers sometimes wonder what's happening in the cars of the congregants on the way home as they may reflect on sermons or other things that they've experienced. But uh, maybe you've wondered what happens in the preacher's car <laughs> on the way home. And um, uh, inevitably, I ask my, my dear wife, I say, honey, well, how is a sermon? And she's, she's the most supportive person you can imagine, as, as you could 
just expect. But last Sunday, she said, uh, well, Tim, you know, you really, there was a, a faux pas. And I said, really? What did I say? And she said, well, you mistakenly made a connection between Gabriel and uh, John the Baptist's wife. So I, I'm like, what? How can I do that? That can't be possible. But she said it. I'm not going to doubt it. So I, re I watched the tape. <laughs> and as Anthony and other preachers here know, one of the most discouraging things is to watch yourself preach. <laughs> but sure enough, last Sunday morning, I said that this Sunday morning, I'd be talking to you about Gabriel's announcement to John the Baptist's wife. I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> you know, usually for me, I, I've got like a five minute recycle in my sermons. So if I say something stupid, I'll say, oh, what I meant to say. Or I'll catch somebody in the congregation going. <laughs> but I certainly did not catch it last week. But I can guarantee you that the angel Gabriel never appeared to John the Baptist's wife. You know why? He didn't have a wife. <laughs> That's right. But the angel Gabriel did appear to John the Baptist's father. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Last week we talked about Gabriel's appearance to Mary and the song she sang called the Magnificat. And today we're going to be talking about the angel's appearance to um, Zechariah, uh, John the Baptist's father. So it's, with this, we turn to John chapter 1. And what we're going to do is uh, these words, we have, we have a, what we call a, a prologue, or since we're talking about songs, it's a prelude, if you will. I want to give you the background. So first of all, we're going to be looking at John, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 1. Pray for me, people. Please just pray for me. That's what Barb said last week. She said when I said that. She said she knew it was tired, so she started to pray for me. And uh, so you need to pray for your preachers, you do. So Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. We'll look at this first. This is God's holy and inspired word. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife has advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you to bring you this good news. And behold, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. The people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. He kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. 
After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Father, we pray that you would guide us this morning through this remarkable narrative of the coming of the forerunner of the Messiah. Fill our hearts with your spirit and give us a spirit of understanding. May your spirit accomplish in our hearts your purpose, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing we see is we see the signature of Luke's writing. We see his detailed historical accuracy, noting that uh, Herod was king in this day. We brought our attention to an individual, a priest named Zechariah. And uh, one thing that's interesting about this, that the, that the Jews have been waiting for the Messiah all these years, and they were so surprised when he shows up. But we're told about Zechariah that he belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. And the days of David, the priests had been organized into 25 divisions, uh, 24. And each division was on duty twice a year. And to give you an idea of how many priests were active at this time, there were 18,000 priests at this time. And Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron, and they were wonderful people. Something that's said that's encouraging about them is that they were faithful followers of the Lord in verse 6, but in verse 7, they had some sadness in their hearts and lives because they were unable to have children. And now they were old. It's now Zechariah's turn to be in, on duty here in Jerusalem, and something remarkable happens. They would receive various assignments by lot, and by far the greatest privilege was to burn incense on the altar of incense. And now this wasn't the great bronze altar outside, it was the uh, altar of incense inside the holy place, right outside the Holy of Holies. So together in the holy place, there was the table of shewbread and the lampstand, um, and also the altar of incense. And the service of incense was the greatest privilege of all. And because of the number of priests, a person was only allowed, if their lot was called, to perform this service only once in their lifetime. So imagine their excitement when Zechariah's name is called to go and burn incense in the altar of incense. Now how this happened, they would enter the holy place. He would have an assistant with him who hold the, held the coals from the altar of burnt offering outside. But then the assistant would withdraw and the priest would offer the incense and pray. Now outside, people were also praying and waiting, and waiting, and waiting for the priest to come out and close the service with a benediction and singing. Well, Zechariah was in for a couple of surprises. First of all, someone, something suddenly appears to him. He was surprised by a messenger. Have you ever been in a dimly lit room and then something suddenly appears? It can be quite scary. In this case, we're told it was an angel of the Lord. And how would you react? Well, Zechariah's reaction is certainly understandable. He was troubled, and when he saw him, fear fell upon him. And as we're going to see in just a moment, this is no ordinary angel. But then comes a surprising message. And the first message is really good news, as we saw with with Mary last week, do not be afraid. That's good news. You want to hear that from a mighty being in your presence, and so this is what the message was, how the message began. But there's good news, says your prayer has been heard. Now which prayer? Which prayer? Well, likely a prayer for a son. What is he going to be like? We're told that his name is going to be John. He's going to be a source of joy and gladness. Imagine this old couple having a baby. Of course, it's a source of joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. This is not just for their family, but it's going to be a rejoicing for the community at large. Well, why? Because we're told he will be great before the Lord. 
Remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, who's going to be devoted to the Lord. We're told that in verse 15, he must not drink wine or strong drink. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. So the priests, when they were on duty, uh, were to abstain from uh, from wine and spirits. They were told this was to be his lifestyle. Now, some believe that this means that he was uh, under the authority or under the commitment of a Nazarite vow. This is this may or may not be so, but there's a, certainly a very clear parallel. But we know that he was filled from the Holy Spirit, even in the womb. How do we know that? Remember when Mary showed up, um, the baby rejoiced in the womb. In the womb. But his mission is going to be significant as well. Verse 16, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He'll go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. He's going to, through his preaching and ministry, bring the people back to the Lord. It implies that they are away. And so you remember that his message is going to be to repent, repent, return to the Lord. He's going to minister in the spirit and power of Elijah. And John is going to be a remarkably powerful prophet. But the impact of his ministry is very specific. You'll notice that he will turn the Israelites to the Lord, but he will also turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. It's amazing how when God, when God comes, it makes a huge difference in not only our vertical relationship with God, but in our relationships with one another. Here's a mention of Elijah. Now you might remember back in the Old Testament, the very last words of the Old Testament book of Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So God is picking up right where he left off. This is quite an amazing message coming through here. But now it's going to see how's it going to happen. Here we see the extraordinary intervention of God in history, don't you think? <clears throat> I love, I love, I think I can relate to Elijah, uh, to Zechariah, though. What does he say? Does he say, um, so be it as you have said to me? Is that what he says? Like Mary, like Mary did? No, he says... How shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife has advanced in years. So Zechariah said, now, now wait a minute. I know, I know that this is a special message, but did you realize how old we are, Mr. Angel? It's a pretty tall order. And here's where we learn that this is not just an ordinary angel. This is an extraordinary angel. He pulls out his calling card. And he says, in verse 19, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to give you this message. Gabriel is one of two, actually three, named angels. Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. He's one of two, what we might call, archangels. And his name means, uh, the, the Hebrew word for mighty man is Gabor, mighty man. But he is Gab Gaborel, Gabriel, mighty man of God. And he's had quite a remarkable record. He explains two visions in the book of Daniel, including the 70 weeks. And you remember we saw last week that it was Gabriel who made the announcement to Mary. And the announcement that he makes 
is certainly, they're often earth shattering and certainly shattering the earth literally. But Zechariah, Zechariah wants to know how this is going to happen. Show me a sign. Gabriel says, I'll give you a sign. You want a sign? I'll give you a sign. You're not going to be able to talk until this promise is fulfilled. You know, somebody once said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, 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 that's, that's not right. God said it, that settles it. That's what Gabriel is saying, because Gabriel was coming up a little short in his, in his faith reservoir right then. But after 400 years, the prophetic word which had been silent is now coming back again. Now, what about the people waiting outside? What, what's going on with him? Maybe he, maybe he got sick. Well, he just can't go busting in there, you know, to the, the holy place like that. And so eventually he comes out, you see. People were waiting and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. When he came out, he wasn't able to speak. And they realized that he'd seen a vision and he kept making signs to them. I, you know, when we get to heaven, I've told you before, I want to see the videos. Uh, of, of the Bible stories, and I can't, I wonder what this looks like when he comes out of there making, making signs. <laughs> Probably not like that. <laughs> and so when his service ended, he, he left, and uh, God was gracious. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden. Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. They saw God's faithfulness in this. And in the interim, we know that Mary comes to visit. And now we'll fast forward to the time of John's birth. We'll look at verses 57 to 66, and these are in your bulletin. Now the time for Elizabeth to give birth, she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother said, no, he shall be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives is called by that name. They made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called, and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered, and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Everybody rejoiced when this baby was born, and a very important rite came on the sixth day, excuse me, the eighth day, the rite of circumcision. And in this case, we have the naming of the child connected to the day of circumcision. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes naming a child can be very challenging. Uh, a, a family that we served at our church in Upper Darby, they had, they had three boys. And she was expecting again. Now, I don't know what your strategy was when you were expecting, but the general strategy is you have a boy's name and a girl's name. Okay, this is before you knew in advance, all right? Because you were surprised when the child was born because you didn't know what the, what the gender was going to be. And so you generally have a boy's name and a girl's name. Well, they had three boys, boy, boy, boy. And wouldn't you think after all this time that girl's name would be ready to go? No. When that child was born, when that girl was born, they could not decide on a name. And it became so serious, it, be, it came time for them to be discharged, but they could not be discharged because they had not yet given the baby a name. They eventually named the baby because, obviously, they left the hospital. <laughs> but in this case, you know, it would be tradition to, to name someone after a family member. 
Let's further propose Zechariah Jr. or Ben Zechariah. There's pressure to do that in their culture. Elizabeth surprisingly said no. And the people protested. And so then they, one of the, one of the things that the commentators ask is, why did they make signs to Zechariah? He wasn't deaf too, we think. But in any case, they sought to know the name. And he wrote down John. And the people were quite amazed, but even more amazed when suddenly this one who was not able to speak for all these months was suddenly breaking out in worship and praise to God for what had happened. John means Yahweh is gracious. I'm sure that the people were absolutely stunned. I mean, everything from the very beginning, and you'll see that. Now, something like that happened around here. You know full well that the word would get out. And after all this, we see that this became a matter of community conversation, and they were very eager to find out what was going to come of this baby. But then, verses 67 and following, we have... Zechariah's song, the Benedictus, named after the first words, blessed, blessed. And uh, this is a song of praise to God for what he's done. A song of God, first of all, for his presence. And I'll read it to you. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he had sworn to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. First of all, it's a song of praise for God's presence. God was, as the song says, visiting his people. R.C. Sproul has noted that our, our planet is the visited planet. That which we need requires personal attention, could not be accomplished by anyone else. The Lord God has visited his people. We don't sing joy to the world, the angel has come. We sing joy to the world, the Lord has come. And what is the purpose for this visitation? The reason that it was absolutely necessary is to redeem his people, redeem his people. Now to redeem means to release through the payment of a price. And uh, some of you are old enough to remember SNH green stamps. Do you remember what the na name of the place was where you got your stuff? was called a Redemption Center. So for those of you who are too young to remember this, there used to be places where if you would go, uh, you would get stamps for every 10 cents that you uh, purchased. And you put them in these books. And then when you filled the books up, there was a catalog where it wasn't online, no. There wasn't such a thing back then. There was a hard catalog, and you could see how many books it would take to get a new toaster or something like that. Uh, but the only way to do that was to go to a redemption center, and there you would redeem these for a gift. And so you have been redeemed, you have been purchased, not with SNH green stamps, you've been purchased with the blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was because God was willing to come to you. He was willing to come into this world 
to visit this planet. That's why his other name is Emmanuel, God with us. And he's also present in your life now as well through the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's not just that praise for the visitation that saves. It's also praise for his power. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David. The horn is a symbol of the animal's strength in a fight. Today we might say muscle. It's muscle. The Lord's going to show himself strong for the sake of his people, for the salvation of his people. But once again, we're reminded that this is fulfillment of prophecy. It's in the house of David. Now, Elizabeth and Zechariah were not from the house of David. So they're not talking about this baby. They're talking about another baby. They're talking about Mary's baby who is coming from the house of David in fulfillment of the promise that was made to David. And surely enough, he would come and we would see his power, wouldn't we? We would see his healing power. We would see him able to heal the blind and cause the lame to walk and even raise the dead and through his own resurrection of the dead become the power of God for salvation. But all this is grounded as we've just seen again. As he spoke, verse 70, by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. It's praise for God's promises kept. It's one thing to make a promise. It's another thing to keep it. And these promises were quite remarkable. And I think you would understand and know that only a sovereign God could make and keep these promises. Only a sovereign God could make these prophecies and fulfill them. Israel had experienced the silent treatment for 400 years. It can be hard. But now the silence has been broken. The name Zechariah means the Lord remembers. All this had been foretold by the prophets, where he would be born, his tribe, his family, that he'd be born of a virgin, they would have a forerunner. And last week we also saw, again, there's a reference here to the promise to Abraham, the covenant that God made with Abraham, that through his offspring, his eventual offspring, all the families of the earth would be blessed. God is faithful. He is reliable. Now these, these verses about enemies, what's that about? That we should be saved from our enemies. Okay, there's a power at work against the enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to share the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. There is a covenant that he swore to our father Abraham that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. Now, of course, many would think that the oppression that there that is included in here is a, a political fear, a political enemy. Uh, Phil Riken wrote, God's people have always had enemies. Since people hate God, it's only natural for them to hate his followers. When he spoke of deliverance, he may partly have been thinking in political terms, but he was also looking for a more lasting liberation, one that would bring freedom from sin. And that's a liberation that we have received now through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And God's salvation, you'll notice, is toward an end. It's toward an end. That we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Isn't it great that you don't have to depend on your own holiness and righteousness to be sure that you are right with God? Isn't that good? But now, having imputed righteousness through Christ's work on our behalf, we can walk fully in faith, in freedom, and without fear in our service to him. Knowing that if God is for us, who can be against us? The answer is nothing and nobody. And then finally, you'll notice that the song turns to John. It says, you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. Do you remember what the angel had said to Mary about her son? 
he would be the son of the Most High. But now here is John, who's going to be the prophet of the Most High, who will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. He is the forerunner. He is the one prophesied in the spirit of Elijah, who has come to prepare the way for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It shouldn't surprise us that there was one sent ahead. Great kings always had heralds who would go before them and sound herald trumpets. The king is coming, the king is coming. And in our own day, I don't know if you've ever been in a city when the president of the United States is coming. It's a problem, my friends. <laughs> Streets are closed, all kinds of things, all kinds of work is done by the advanced team. Well, John the Baptist was the advanced team for the coming of the King of Kings. In Matthew chapter 3, we read these words. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But this is the one referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And we know that John was a, an interesting character. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 4, we read, John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Did you know what the Oxford Dictionary word of the year is this year for 23? The word is riz, R-I-Z-Z. -Z. It's short for charisma. So, you know, I can, I can come up to Jason and say, hey, Jason, you've got riz. <laughs> you got riz. You got charisma. Another popular iteration of the word is Rizzler, a title given to individuals who, well, possess a lot of riz. You're Rizzler. <laughs> One of the uh, words that was beaten out by riz was Swifty. And so let's put it this way. As you go on to study the life of John and his work, he had riz. Yeah, but he not only had he not only had the kind of riz that was charismatic in an earthly way, but he was filled with the spirit to proclaim the coming of the Lord. And if there's any doubt about the message that he came to bring, it says to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. There it is again, my friends. Over and over and over, we're reminded of why we needed to be visited by the Lord himself. We need to have our sin problem addressed. This is only through the one that John is going to be pro proclaiming. The one whom we've already heard has been named Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So John's message was not one of revolution from Rome, but one of repentance from sin. And when Jesus was identified by John, John was, he saw Jesus coming and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There it is. And I ask you, my friends, this day, have you gotten that point of this whole thing? This whole coming of Christ, have you gotten it? That it's, it's not to make you, sure, it makes us feel good. It makes us stressed, too, to be honest with you. But the point is so that you, you would have some way to have your sins addressed and forgiven. And the only way that that's possible is through this one that John was going to predict and go before. And if you miss that, you miss the point. You miss the point. So I urge you today, if you've not looked to Jesus Christ as your Savior from your sins, I encourage you to do that today. Talk about a new joy that runs into your life. Because look what happens. Because the tender mercy of our God, the sunrise shall visit us from on high. The people of darkness sitting in a great light or sitting in darkness will see a great light. Reminds us of Malachi chapter 4. But you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, will rise with healing in its wings. So not only is the silence broken with communication from God, 
but the darkness is shattered. You ever pull an all-nighter studying? I had a, I was a student at, at Haverford College, and we were working on the campus there. He used to, when he pulled an all-nighter, he would brew the strongest cup of coffee that he could, and then he'd dip three tea bags in it. Of course, there are other things now that people use. But if you pull them out, you know, you know what, it's, what it's like when you see the, the glimmer. It's so dark, and then the glimmer of light begins to fill the sky. And if there's clouds, it begins to be a beautiful symbol of the coming of the sun. And then the stars, then the stars disappear. The so-called morning star seems to shine bright until the sun arises. That's what John was. He was the, the morning star. But he knew that as the sun of righteousness was revealed, that he would recede, as John himself said, I must decrease, that you can increase. And all of this to guide our feet into the way of peace. And this is the kind of shalom, shalom of relationship with God. You see, God was determined to come to provide this gift of salvation for anyone who will believe. And I just put it this way. Do you see the trouble he went to? All the way. Oh, so what do you, what do you take away from this? God remembers, God remembers. Zechariah means Yahweh remembers. He remembers his promises. He remembers his prophecies. He remembers you. And as always, when the Bible uses the word remember, at least in many cases, it means remembering with the objective to do something. Not only does he remember what he acts. He carries out his plan in history. And my friends, I'm so fed up with people. You want to know what I'm fed up about? I'm fed up about all the people who want to take the miracles out of the Bible. And... Jay Gresham Machen said, he, he wrote a book called Christianity and Liberalism. <clears throat> I encourage you to read it. Uh, he was the founder of Westminster Seminary, I would just add. He said, the New, Net New Testament without the miracles would be far easier to believe. But the trouble is, would it be worth believing? No. It took God's miraculous intervention in history to accomplish what you and I need in our salvation coming to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And then now, we, through faith in Christ, we now have the opportunity to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. And one of the reasons we gather together is not only to worship him, but to encourage each other to serve him in holiness and righteousness. And we can do this without fear because of what he's done for us. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your promises, Lord, your faithfulness to your promises. Thank you for your faithfulness to this old couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah. We thank you for sending the forerunner who would make the way straight for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you so much that as that word was proclaimed, the word of repentance, Lord, to prepare the people for his coming. We thank you that you've called us once again to repent as well, to, to turn away from our sin and to, to serve you in holiness and righteousness without fear. I also ask this morning, Father, that perhaps there's someone here who for whom you have seemed silent. I pray that they would know that you have spoken in your son. And you speak words of the promise of forgiveness and the promise of everlasting life. 
And for this, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn. Receive these words. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, children uh, four years through fifth grade are dismissed for the music room. And before I get into the, the many announcements that we have, um, Kathleen Goliath is going to get up and give a short update um, for the search committee. Good morning. Good morning. I want everybody to hear me. <laughs> um, our search committee is uh, working. We have reviewed our candidates. We have narrowed it down. 
and we are, we have started our first round of interviews, and we hope to be finished with the first round of interviews by the end of the year. And that's my report. Thank you, Kathleen. So we have a bunch of announcements to go over. Um, the first is uh, to announce the uh, Christmas card uh, shower that the We Care Ministry is doing. Um, they're encouraging everyone to send out uh, Christmas cards to those that are homebound. So if you feel so led to do that, I think there's lists out in the narthex for you to do that. Uh, second, there is the uh, Christmas giving opportunity. Um, I'm sure everyone has seen the tree in the narthex. On that tree, there are tags. You can pick a tag um, off the tree, and it tells you um, who you're giving to and, and the gift um, that that person uh, wants. Um, so please uh, take an opportunity to stop by and check that out. Um, as Tim mentioned earlier, there are these cards that are in the bulletin to invite uh, your friends and family to the Christmas Eve. Uh, you can invite them to the service in the morning or also the service uh, in the evening. So please uh, uh, think about who you'd hand these out to, and there are more out in the narthex. Um, a reminder that there is choir rehearsal today after Sunday school for the children and adult choir. Um, and then a couple more things I wanted to mention was uh, where the, uh, um, there's still a need for cookies for ESL. They're gonna be doing like a little Christmas celebration with the students and you can still make cookies. Um, they would need to be uh, brought to the church by Wednesday of this week. So if you feel so inclined to do that, please, please do that. Also, um, Youth Underground Church is tonight, and uh, they are meeting here at 6.30, and that goes from 6.30 to 8.30. And then also the young adults are meeting at Josiah and Alicia's house, um, and I think that's at 7.00. Um, so please, uh, if you're a young adult, please think about uh, coming out for that. And I think that wraps up all of the announcements. Please keep in, in mind the family matters and prayer requests and praises that are in the bulletin too this week. With that, you are dismissed. Have a great uh, Lord's Day. You're welcome. I'm getting there. It's, oh, it's, great. it's new for me, so. I like it. I'm trying. <laughs> me too. No, but you're a pro, though, Tim. That's the thing. Um, you make it look easy. <laughs> Do you ever get nervous at all anymore? Are you done? Are you serious? Because you, you, you don't, I don't sense it at all in you. None. Huh. I would not have guessed that. I'm surprised Jim didn't pick up on your mistake last week. Oh, I, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Just didn't say it. <laughs> it's really, it's really, it's really, I've said some things, and then I, I somebody reacts. Uh -huh. And if Barbara had been sitting in front of me, she reacted. She told me that she and Ruth 